So I said I was done with booktube for the moment, but this book really pulled me out of early retirement. So here we are. Hello everyone, my name is Jordan Harvey and today I'm going to be talking about The City of Brass by S.A. Chakraborty. I really hope I pronounced that right. Um, it's not going to be structured like one of my normal reviews and instead we're going to be talking about the brilliant ways in which the author crafted this rich political landscape that is rife with conflict and tension and really sets up the rest of the series to be very politically intriguing. Throughout the video, however, I will be sharing my thoughts on a few of the plot points and characters, so there will be some review elements if that's what you're looking for. Do keep in mind though that I haven't read the other books in the series yet, so this will just be a look at how it sets up the series, um, but only in the first book, and also be aware that there's going to be so many spoilers. This is nothing but spoilers, so keep that in mind. If you haven't read it, I really do recommend picking up this novel if you like political high fantasy. So with that out of the way, let's dive in. So I really like this book. It follows two protagonists, Nari and Ali Zaid. Nari is a magical healer, swindler, and thief from Cairo who accidentally one day summons Dara, who is a magical deva warrior, setting off a chain of events that basically has her fleeing from Cairo with him to try to get to Devabad, which is the kind of capital of the magical world. In Devabad, we follow Ali, who is the second son of the king who is ruling the city and the rest of the magical world, and Ali is sympathetic to the Shafit who have mixed human and Deva blood and who are basically treated as second-class citizens, putting it very kindly in this world. They have a rebellious group that he has been funding unbeknownst to the rest of his family, uh, and this is starting to destabilize the fragile ecosystem that is keeping the jinn in power. If you are having trouble keeping up, fair enough. It is a very complex and fleshed out world with a lot to learn. So to help us with this endeavor, I am going to be using a visual aid throughout to kind of give you a sense of who I'm talking about and where they align with politically in this system. So the main power players in this first book are the Jinn, who are ruled by the royal family, the Deva, who used to be the tribe in power before a bloody rebellion, who are now led by Nari, who hails from the old ruling family, but also Kave, who is the king's right-hand man. Then we have the Shafit, led by the Tanzim, which is the group organizing to rebel. And finally, we have the miscellaneous magical forces outside of Devabad, including the Peri, the Marid, and the Ifrit. We're going to start with the jinn and the royal family. I really appreciate the ways in which Ali Zaid is set up and then challenged, especially by his family. I think especially in high fantasy, we kind of fall into these tropes of good versus evil, but this book is far more nuanced in its approach to the politics and the world. And I think there's also this tendency to sort of romanticize moral extremism and really having this like super strong conviction in your beliefs without questioning them. So I like the way that each of the characters, especially Ali Zaid, is challenged in those beliefs and actually changes them throughout the course of the novel. And I think a lot of that comes from the construct of good versus evil that this book really tends to reject. The ways in which Ali Zaid's black and white views get challenged and questioned and then begin to change I thought was brilliant and I am going to go a little bit more in depth in that now. So what are Ali's beliefs? At the beginning of the novel, he's supposedly helping a religious Shafit leader who is a part of the Tanzim, and he is supposed to be helping the sick and the poor with the money that Ali is giving him. With that as the character's introduction, one might expect Ali Zaid's actions to be portrayed as good in opposition to the oppressive ruling class. However, Ali has reason to believe that they may be using the money to arm themselves, so if that's the case, Ali wants to pull his secret patronage. And they are, in fact, using that money to arm themselves to basically incite violence against the purebloods, which Ali finds disgusting. To me, this reads like those billionaires who have amassed their fortune on the backs of poor people, but then get to pat themselves on the backs for donating a small amount of their money to charity and then get super pissed off when the people that they are basically underpaying, who have horrible working conditions and like no benefits, organize to try to change the fact that they're being underpaid and have horrible working conditions and also have no benefits. They get super pissed about that, so it's like very performative. So that's kind of how it reads in this situation to me. 
even though donating to the poor is obviously a good thing, Ali is still supporting the system that is keeping those people poor. And he gets called out for that, which I think is valid. So that is the first way in which his beliefs are challenged. That being said, even though it's a bit performative, he still has this arbitrary kind of desire to have the Shafit be more equal in their society. This desire for equality and the ways in which to achieve that are then questioned by Ali's father, who is very much for not rocking the boat. As mentioned, there are a lot of tensions at play. The Jinn are basically a tribal society, and the tribe's power dynamics is very fragile. And this is especially true with the Deva tribe, who are particularly anti-Shafit due to their historical and religious beliefs um, that date back for a very long time. I'm not saying that's right, I'm just relaying the facts. The king then is in a very difficult position, because if he shows any favor to the Shafit, the Deva will get angry and it could potentially lead to conflict. However, if he doesn't, the Shafit are already starting to organize, so if, you know, that happens and they actually do rebel, that will also obviously lead to conflict. So instead he leans into the established order and brutalizes the already oppressed Shafit in the hopes of quelling the rising rebellion. Now this of course also horrifies Ali, but he is not in a place where he's willing to see the downfall of his family or the death of hundreds of pure-blood jinn or himself, which of course could happen if either the Deva or the Shafit rebelled. It's easier and safer for them to maintain the status quo, and I think honestly a lot of people if they were put in the same position, would react the same way in that they would protect their own people rather than an outsider group. In fact, I can kind of confidently say that that's true because we've seen it time and time again throughout history. Again, I'm not saying that that's right, I'm just saying I understand the character's motivations. And while I don't think the book makes a direct comparison to any one group of marginalized people, I do think it takes a broader look and exploration of the institutions that lead to systemic oppression. I also don't see the king as a purely evil force, and I don't think the book intends him to be viewed that way, um, even though I think it obviously would have been very easy for the author to write him that way, as we do see with a lot of high fantasy. Well, I obviously don't think what he does is right, and I do hope to see in the future books the challenging of the powers of the monarchy and hopefully the dismantling of it. I also do understand why he made the decisions that he made. He has a duty to protect his people, which he is not doing because the Shafit are also his people, but his hope, I think, is to basically reduce the overall amount of bloodshed, especially for the djinn, because he is a pure-blood djinn, and also it helps him maintain his political power, which obviously he wants. Again, this guy is not a good guy. I don't like him, but I do think there is nuance to his character, which I appreciate. He's stuck between a rock and a hard place, and he's basically choosing the path of least resistance. And lastly, Muntadir, uh, who is Ali's older brother and is the one who is going to inherit the throne. He doesn't have a particularly important role in this book as far as the um, swaying things politically, but I do think he is one to talk about. Um, I don't think his role can be entirely dismissed from the novel, so we're gonna touch on it briefly because I think he's gonna play a major part in the upcoming books. We're first introduced to him as this sort of privileged prince who partakes a little bit too much in wine and women, um, but we come to understand really quickly that he is also quite good politically. He's very charming and he understands the nuances of social politics. He also seems to have a slightly more balanced perspective than that of his brother, and I think that's in large part to do with his uh, romantic feelings towards Kaveh's son, and uh, Kaveh is basically the right-hand man of the king and one of the Deva tribe. So that kind of ties him to the Devas, but he also has a lot of love for Ali, and because of that he's a little bit more sympathetic than his father to the plights of the Shafit. Then of course his brother betrays him, and I think that pushes him more towards the Deva side, so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out in the following books. And I think this is a great example of what makes Chakraborty's handling of 
the politics so brilliant because it easily it's it's a bunch of really heavy topics and it really could have felt preachy or heavy-handed but it doesn't and I think a lot of that is to do with the fact that it basically simplifies these complex dynamics down to the character relationship level. It makes the tensions feel very personal and emotional rather than abstract and intellectual. But let's move on to the David tribe. Nari, while I did enjoy her perspective, was probably the less interesting of the two protagonists to me and I think that is in large part to do with the fact that she was basically the vessel for a lot of the exposition because she's kind of the fish out of water character so she's learning the things that we need to learn as the reader to understand this very complex world. So she grew up believing that she was human and then she discovers that she is actually, she hails from basically the ruling family of the Deva tribe, which are the Nahids. Dara, who she accidentally summons, basically comes from the family that used to serve her family. And he's also one of the most powerful and feared warriors in the history of the world. So she arrives with him in Devabad and she finds out that she's not Shafit. Uh, she's actually a Deva pureblood, who was cursed to look human. I was a bit surprised at how little Nari seemed to care about the oppression and segregation of the Shafis, especially because she grew up thinking that she was human, and then on the way to Devabad when she was spending time with Dara, she believed she was Shafit, and she got really pissed off at the way that he was talking about the Shafit, obviously, um, because she believed she was one. I understand that she's acclimating to this new life, but Girl really did not spend a lot of time thinking about the ways in which she could potentially help these people who she believed for a long time that she was a part of. So that's interesting. Especially because she actually has power within the Deva tribe because she is one of the Nahids, so she has this like social power bestowed upon her. So she could actually probably make some positive changes in the way that they're viewed and she just doesn't spend the energy doing it which like okay so while she's in the desert she has a little insta love moment with dara um who basically hates the ruling family because he fought against them in the war that i mentioned previously between the deva and the jinn and so she spends a lot of the book kind of going back and forth between whether she trusts Dara's POV or Ali and kind of, yeah, figuring out who she trusts and where she belongs in this society. One of the things that I will mention really quickly is I do like the fact that she actually gets homesick and doesn't like very quickly acclimate to this new society because I think a lot of times in adventure fantasy novels, um, characters are forced to like leave their home forever and they never really touch on the fact that that can be very emotionally traumatic, I have no doubt. Um, so I do really like that part of her character that she does struggle to find her place in this society and also feels really homesick for some of the small comforts that she remembers from Cairo. What's also interesting about Nari in this book is that she obviously didn't grow up with the Deva religion or their traditions, so she actually pushes against some of those things that she's then expected to know and um, you know, embrace, I guess, when she gets to Devabad. She's kind of coming at it from this outside perspective and seems to challenge it in some ways, but also is forced to kind of assimilate into it uh, in order to fully make her tribe happy. And I really thought that that was an interesting dynamic because she's thrust into this position of power, but she basically has to use it to make the people around her happy, but she also has no idea how to do that because there are so many conflicted forces that she's supposed to make happy. Um, so it's a very like politically delicate position to be in and she is not one for politics, so it makes it especially challenging for her and very interesting to read about. She's also forced into a marriage with Muntadir at the end of the novel and I'm very interested to see where that goes because she and him have very little in common personality wise, uh, let alone politically, um, and their priorities you know for what they want to achieve are very different, so I'm very excited to see how that plays out in the following books. And then we have Dara. 
So he has been out of Devabad for centuries. He was a slave after the war and basically has like amnesia for like centuries of his existence. And so when he returns to Devabad, things are not at all what he remembered. And he's also very traditional. Things have progressed quite a bit, even though obviously it's not a very progressive society. It is more progressive than when he left it. Um, so he is very traditional in his Deva views. He basically believes their tribe to be the superior tribe, uh, the Shafits to be like abominations, and also anyone in his tribe that coexists with the royals and the jinn to be slightly untrustworthy. That's how far his beliefs go, which is great. His beliefs do get challenged when he gets summoned by Nari and believes her to be Shafi and they travel together in the desert because, as I mentioned, there was that insta-lovey moment. He finds that he does actually enjoy spending time with this Shafi girl, you know, enough to want to bang. But then they get to Devabad and it's revealed that she's pure blood, so it kind of negates all of that and he just is reaffirmed in his belief that purebloods are better. So I actually didn't really like that choice. I think it would have been stronger for her to actually be Shafit because it would have made other characters really question their beliefs but also would have put her in a more precarious political position because Shafits are kind of seen as this inferior class of being. It probably would have made the marriage to Mundadir more difficult to do because I'm sure the royal family would not want human blood intermingling, but it would have been a good alliance to bridge the gap between the Davis and the Jinn. So I think it would have been a more interesting political position for her to be in and again would have made some of the characters really question their beliefs and their stance on the Shafit, because, especially because the David tribe specifically is so anti-Shafit. So if she's the last uh, Nahid to be alive, then, you know, she's the last of this ruling family, but she was also human. That would have been a really fascinating angle to explore within the actual politics of the tribe. So in conclusion with Dara, I didn't love the character. I don't particularly love ignorant characters who don't change uh, or grow, and I also don't love the romanticization of ignorant characters because he is romanticized in this book. He's seen as like a hot babe even though he's problematic, which I don't love. I don't love, I've never loved, and that's why I don't like Sarah J Maas. Period. I do want to talk about Kaveh though because I think he's a very interesting character. He's very invested in Deva rights and status and he's kind of worked his way up to be the right-hand man of the king, which is very interesting and I'm sure it was very hard to do. I'd love to know more of the history of how that happened, but he really is in a very privileged position and I'm sure the king is aware of that and is um, very consciously trying to bridge the gap between the Jinn and the Deva. So um, I'm sure it's not just, you know, Kaveh's brilliant political mind that has gotten him there. It was very much both of them, I have no doubt. So while Dara wants to protect and fight for the Deva people with force, Kaveh very much wants to do the same with politics. He's very loyal to his people, but is definitely willing to play the game to seem like he's not overly loyal to his people, um, and like he's keeping, you know, the city's best interest at heart, not just the Deva people, but he very much is. And I think his one weakness is his relationship with Ali Zaid, uh, because he does not like or trust Ali. And I think a large part of that is to do with the way that Ali kind of favors the Shafit, he doesn't trust that, with a 10-foot pole. And I think maybe also part of that is that they're both very attached to their separate cultures and religions, which tend to go against one another, or not coexist 100% peacefully. I definitely don't think we get to see Kaveh's full potential in this novel, but I do think that he's going to be a very interesting player in the coming novels, and I'm excited to see what he does. In my mind, he's a bit of a little finger where he keeps his hand close, um, minus his relationship with Ali, but I do think he is quite smart politically, so I'm excited to see the ways in which he kind of mentors Nari, because she is also not very politically minded, so I think that that's going to be an interesting relationship, the way he kind of influences Nari politically, um, but also his connections to the king and uh, to Muntadir through Jamshid, his son. So, 
very excited to see how that all plays out. In my mind, the Shafit also aren't played out to their full potential in this book, but I have the suspicion that that's because it's more of a three book arc for them. They're really used to kind of set up the tensions between the ruling class in this book, and I think that that's alright, um, especially because they deal with heavy losses in this book. Two of their most important leaders get killed, so I think it'll be really interesting to see how they rebuild in the coming novels. And also they lose favor with Ali, so they no longer have access to the royal treasury, so it'll be very interesting to see how they regroup and start to fund their rebellion, because that is not easy to do. The other magical beings were also only kind of touched on, and were mostly used to add tension to the action sequences. Ali, however, does get possessed by the Marid, and I think that that is going to be important in the future, uh, because he... it seems like he has been affected by them, um, and it has changed his relationship to water, because they are a water people, a water creature, um, so once he is possessed by them. I think that has forever changed him and also his personal power. I feel like that will have been modified. That's just a hypothesis, but I do think that that's going to affect his physical powers, which will probably also affect his standing and how he navigates politics because he's now even more of an outsider. Then there is the Ifrit, which are, I would say, like the most like pure evil depiction in this book. Even then, though, they are humanized a bit. In the one scene where Nari basically kills one and they're seen as, you know, emotional beings, which even surprises Nari in the book. And I really do like the fact that Chakraborty makes it a priority to humanize all of the creatures in the story so that there is no pure evil, but they are probably the most evil of all of the creatures. And even then, they are aligned with Nari's mother, who is not as dead as everyone seems to think. So it'll be interesting to see the way that she harnesses their power in the coming books. I also did skip over some of the characters in this video uh, that don't have as much screen time, but do play minor roles in the politics and will likely be an influence to the characters and the story as it progresses just for the sake of brevity. Some of those include Jamshid, who is Kaveh's son and, uh, you know, is in a romantic relationship with Muntadir, and then Nizreen, who is Nari's assistant, who also is her teacher because she served Nari's mother back in the day when Nari's mother was a healer at the palace, so she has some political experience, she has experience with the tribe, and she's very loyal to the David tribe. And I think that's what makes this a good political fantasy novel. Like Game of Thrones, each character, while they might may align with a specific group or ideology, they do all have their own beliefs and goals, and that helps to make it feel like a very real world, but also a very complex one. I think it works particularly well here because the side characters each challenge and support the protagonist's worldviews in different ways. Having two protagonists also gives us a much more nuanced understanding of the state of affairs in Devobad and the magical world. I think the author could have easily had them on complete opposite sides of the conflict, but I actually think it's much stronger having them align in certain ways and have specific like kind of crossover in their beliefs and morals, but also challenge each other in other ways and obviously have different um, alliances and priorities when it comes to their politics and their beliefs. Unlike Game of Thrones, which besides the zombies and the dragons and then like a few other miscellaneous characters or events, which make it seem like it's like high fantasy for the first few books because it, the, it, the fantasy elements are really not the priority, this book really embraces the magical elements, and I think it does a really good job in making them add a lot of tension to the story, and it does so because it's integrated really well into the political landscape of the world. The magical elements from the different creatures aren't treated as morally good or morally bad, but instead are seen more as tools that reflect the, I guess, morals of the characters that are using them. It also strengthens certain themes and ideas that I think will be explored throughout this series, like casts and blood purity, so I'm excited to see how that plays out. But that is all I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed this little chat about this banger of a book. It's really good. I highly recommend it if you haven't read it, but I'm also super disappointed in you if you haven't read it because you should have done that before you watched this video because there were spoilers. I digress. 
Um, the point is, yeah, I really, really enjoy this book. I can't wait to read the rest of the series. I hope that it is just as politically interesting because I honestly haven't read a fantasy book that handles politics so well in a while. Um, but that is it. Uh, I know this is also a different style of video. I haven't really done something like this with a book discussion before, so if you enjoyed it, please let me know in the comment section down below and maybe I'll do another one for the following book or the rest of the series or something else. Um, but that is it. Thank you for watching and I will see you next time. Bye!